hear its sound, have all the people give a mighty shout. Then the city wall will collapse and the people will advance each man straight ahead. Now, if you've been a part of Sunday school as a kid, you've heard the story and you know where the story goes. But we're, we're going to pause there for a second. And I just want to give you a, a, a little bit of background about Joshua. And then we'll talk about the walls themselves. Uh, do you understand Joshua comes out after the greatest leader of, of God's people ever? I mean, he directly spoke with God. He, with, with Moses, Moses was a part of the plagues. Uh, Moses was a part of the parting of the Red Sea. Moses, with Moses, manna fell from heaven and they ate bread in the desert. Quail came, he struck a rock with the staff and water poured from a dry rock. I mean, the things that Moses accomplished through God's power was just awe-inspiring. And throughout those stories, if you know Joshua, Joshua was, was, was there with Moses. He was outside. Uh, when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, Joshua was not there making the idol. He was actually in the mountainside waiting for Moses to come down. Joshua was faithful. He was a, a faithful kind of second in command. Even when Aaron was doing all the things Aaron shouldn't have been doing, Joshua was there. Joshua, Joshua was faithful, but at the same time, he stood in the shadow of a really great and mighty man. Now, if you read in Joshua, yeah, there was the parting of the Jordan, but he parts the river. I would, I would love to part a river. I would go to your grandpa's property and part the river and pick up all the fish, uh, but I don't have that ability. But Moses there, when he stood, the Red Sea parted. Do you understand? Even as big as that was, he still stood in the shadow of a man who was considered great. And the question that was going through his, his head over and over again was, do I measure up? Do I measure up? Do I measure up to the guy who came before me? And, and as he looks and he, and he recalls all the things that he participated and saw with Moses, the answer that he inevitably comes back to over and over again is, no, I, I don't measure up. I'm not Moses. Well, let me, let me do, uh, talk to you, to you a little bit now about... Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho and, and just a little bit about the archaeology that took place there at Jericho. Uh, it's been excavated numerous times. Uh, if you go to the current archaeologists, just kind of like when we talked about uh, looking at the Exodus itself, they will tell you that... Jericho was not conquered by the Israelites. Most likely it was done by the Egyptians. And why? Well, because it doesn't fit within their timeline. The Israelites wouldn't have been there. However, if you look into the archaeological, archaeological evidence and you look at um, the story that we find in Scripture, all of a sudden you find the same thing. The archaeological evidence shows that the wall fell out. Not inside, but out. That was important. Uh, we're going to look at some, some, some statistics because that allowed the Israelites who could not have otherwise to enter straight into the city. It also shows that there was a massive fire sometime around when, that, uh, when those walls fell because there is a layer of ash of, of extreme heat. And so even the, even the archaeologists say that there, they were, the city was conquered in a very short order. They've gone into, into the city and they have gone into the homes. And in the homes, almost every home has large jars of, of grain. And they're full to capacity, meaning that there weren't months of siege going on. The city was conquered in a very short order, just like in our story in Scripture. So it was conquered in a short time. The walls fell out so that whatever uh, nation was going against them was able to enter in. What we also know about the walls is that uh, most of the city-states, when they built their, their walls in their cities, they, uh, when they built these things, they built them on hills. Uh, and, and these hills that they built, um, 
they built upon gave them the advantage because any approaching force, you could look down, you were looking down upon them. It was easier for you to fire as opposed for them to fire upon you. Uh, it was hard to scale such walls. And so they actually went around the actual hill of Jericho and there were two walls. And the first wall, they took a portion of the hill and they dug it away and they built a stone support wall that was 10 that was 10 to 12 feet high that was the first thing as you approach you approach this rock wall that was 10 to 12 feet high it became a support wall for the brick mud wall that went on top of it now that brick mud wall that was on top of it was anywhere from 20 to 26 feet so triple the measurement I just showed you. Imagine three of our sanctuaries stop uh, top on one another. That's the wall that they were facing. Now it wasn't just that it was a tall wall, it was also a wide wall. By a wide wall, I mean that the wall itself was, it, was six feet deep. Six feet wide. That's impressive. And in ancient times, if you had come upon that and you had seen that structure and you knew how thick it was, you just couldn't go ram and knock it down. That looked impenetrable. But it goes further. There, weren't just, there wasn't just one wall. There were two walls. And there was a mud brick wall that went further up the hill of Jericho. And that mud wall was, again, 20 to 26 feet high and 6 feet in diameter. Now here, the captain of the Lord's army, the Lord has already given you the king and its people. And look at the wall and think about what was going through Joshua's mind. Look at the wall and think about uh, as he saw that, that impenetrable fortress uh, and all those places that probably tried to conquer Jericho before that could not. And imagine as he's thinking, I don't measure up to who Moses was. And now I'm being asked to do a task that just seems about impossible. Well, we're going we're gonna to have a little bit of assistance this morning. I'm going to ask if uh, another one of my assistants, he's going to come and he's going to grab the Christian flag. And if you could come and just stand up here in front of us. Um, Richie, open the two back side doors right here. Make sure they're propped open. This is the portion where you get to participate in the sermon. So we're going to do something different we've never done before. I'm going to ask, uh, if you notice in Scripture, one of the statements that was made was that as they marched around the wall, they were told that they were to be silent. We are going to march around our walls this morning. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up, and I'm going to ask for you to make... Now, if you physically have issues walking, nobody's going to think anything ill of you if you have to sit down. You just stay seated. But for the rest of us, I want you to move to the aisle in the center here. Or not the center, the other side aisles. You guys can make your way up here to Gabe right here. You stay right where you're at, Ian. Make your way up here to Gabe. Okay. I'm going to ask for the next 10 to 15 minutes. And kids, you're going to have to make sure moms and dads listen, okay? To be as quiet as possible. And you're going to follow Gabe. And Gabe's going to begin to march around the sanctuary going towards Ian. Are you ready, Gabe? Are we legit? Well, you walk, march. I'm marching. Okay. So as they began to march around the first time, as they're walking around this, this wall, the first wall, which is not just a 26-foot structure, but is actually closer to 40 feet when you consider the support stone structure that's underneath it. As they're walking around, uh, they're being looked down upon by the soldiers from Jericho, and Jericho soldiers are not being quiet. As they look down, they notice this ragtag group of Israelites, this wannabe nation. And as they look down, they notice that not everybody in that particular group of forces is physically up to par. 
Few of them are panning and trying to catch their breath, and they're not in shape like they ought to be. Uh, maybe somebody's got a bum leg, and as they march, they kind of drag. And, and as, they're up, as they're up there, they're looking down, and as they look down, they're, they're commenting, Who are you to take on Jericho? You, you're weak. Your men are out of shape. There is no way in the world that you're going to be able to come into our city. Why don't you just go home now? You're wasting your time. You're wasting your resources. Go down the road, past Jericho. You are all fools. We can think about that this morning, and the truth is what? Many times when the Lord asks us to do something, we say, well, Lord, I would, but I got this bum knee. I'm physically not where I ought to be, Lord, and if I was just in a little better shape, I'd be willing to help you, Lord. But you know where I'm at. And they marched around the first day in silence as they were mocked. Second day comes. Second time to, to march around this particular wall that looks so impenetrable. And as they march around, uh, they began to notice things as they looked down upon this ragtag group of Israelite, supposedly armed soldiers. Some of them were really old, and some of them were really young. And comments began to be made as they marched in silence. They looked down and they said, Who are you to come against Jericho? What do you have for soldiers but a bunch of grandpas? Those men are so old, they can barely, they can barely hold up their shields. In fact, I'm going to guess if you're not careful, a few of them are going to fall dead if you march too long and too hot in this hot sun. Not only do I see old men out there, but as I look at those down there at your, your armed forces that are supposedly going to take us on, some of them are young. I mean... Are, any, are all of you even out of diapers? I, I look down upon you and I think, who are you? What kind of experience? We have experienced soldiers. We have dealt with other armed forces before and they have not conquered us. And you think with, with who you are, with not even being a nation, with a, with a ragtag army, that you're going to come and you're going to conquer us? No experience or you're too old. You know, the Lord asks us to do things, doesn't he? He says, will you serve me, church? And we say, well, God, I'd serve you, but, you know, my time to serve in the church, I'm retired. Or I'd serve you, Lord, but I'm a little young and I just don't have the experience that other people have. I'd love to help, but I can't do it. And the second day came to an end. Third time, they go to march around these walls, these walls that are almost 40 feet tall. And that's only the first wall, not to mention the second wall. And as they begin to look, they notice that the marching really isn't in unison. And I looked down tonight, to this morning, and you guys aren't any better. In fact, occasionally, one of the soldiers would step on the person in front of them. And it was pretty obvious they didn't know how to form lines. And, and they were not trained like the Jericho soldiers. You think you're going to take on Jericho? I look down upon you and I can tell that some of you guys have never even wielded a sword. I look down upon you guys and as I look at you, it's pretty obvious you don't know what you're doing. Why in the world did your leader Joshua take you here? He's a fool and you're a fool for following him. Go and, and practice with some little tribe that doesn't have walls and, and become real soldiers. Then come back and challenge us. But you cannot conquer Jericho. You know, God comes to us and he asks us to serve. And our response often is what? Well, I'd serve pastor, but I've not been trained to teach Sunday school. I'd serve pastor, but there's just people that are better qualified than me. And, and you know, they would be better in that position. But God isn't calling them, is he? God's calling you. God's asking you to serve in the church. God's asking you to be involved so that when the walls of Jericho come down, we will be prepared. And the third day ended. Fourth day. As those 
Jericho soldiers are looking down off of that 40 foot, 6 foot thick wall and they're looking at this ragtag group of Israelites and they're noticing that they're not saying anything. They begin to mock him again. And they say to him, you know, I notice some of you guys are the age where you have children. So you're going to try to take us on. What happens when we kill all of your men? You'll be a nation of children and women. Hey dads, think about your sons and your daughters and your wives. Why in the world would you take on something that you know is an impossible task? Why would you show up and follow Joshua here? You know, you'd just be better off to quit while you're ahead because it's pretty obvious you're not going to be able to do it. That's right. A lot of times. And the Lord comes to you and he asks you to serve in the church. And what do you say? Well, I'd serve. But, you know, my family's busy. I got things going on, and if I just had a little more time, I'd do it. But, you know, I work third shift, or I work 60 hours a week, or, or I've got, you don't know how my kids are involved in this. I go, it's good that I make it to church on a Sunday morning, let alone me be asked to do anything. I just don't know that of all the things I could be asked, if I can sacrifice my family, Lord. Four days they'd walked around. The fifth day they get up and as they look down and they look at those soldiers, they say to those Israelite band, uh, I noticed that some of your equipment looks a little old. You know those supposed swords that some of you carry would serve better as butter knives. I don't know that they could actually cut or kill anybody. Maybe if you could blunt force trauma, but they're pretty obvious that they're pretty dull and, and they couldn't do a whole lot. You know, the armor you have, uh, I believe it's being held together by rust. If it wasn't for the rust, you wouldn't even be able to do what you could do. And, and as, as the Israelites looked at one another, they realized, you know, their equipment maybe not was up, not up to par. They weren't this organized force, this organized army, and, and their equipment wasn't as nice as, and they didn't have the means to, to have the stuff. And, you know, is that any different than us? God asked us to serve, and what is our response? Well, you know, Lord, if I had more means, I would, I would help out, but... I just don't have the deep pockets some people have. I'd give more, Lord, but um, I can't do it because I just don't have the means. And it's not that God is asking us to give more than our neighbors, but sometimes he's just asking us to contribute. And we say, if we had more means, if I had more training, if I had more ability, I would, I'd be a part of that. And we tell him no. Five days. They walked around in silence as they were mocked by the soldiers on top of that 40-foot wall that was six foot thick. Sixth day comes and, well, they realized that it looked like maybe the Israelites were getting a little tired and they're wondering to themselves, what are these goofy group of people doing? And they started thinking to themselves, Hey, why are you wasting time walking around the wall? How's your relationship with your spouse right this morning? How's your relationship with your children this morning? You know, you're wasting all this time walking around this wall when you ought to be investing yourself in your relationship with other people. Yeah. And as the Israelites thought about it, they thought, you know, my relationship really isn't really that good with my, my spouse. My relationship isn't really that good with my children. My dad and I just had a fight the other night. What am I doing wasting my time walking around this wall following Joshua? It's not like he's Moses. And doubt wants to creep in. Uh, we get more involved in church, but you know, the truth is the relationship's on the rocks. The truth is our children don't want anything to do with us because we're already too churchy as it is. The truth is Mom and dad broke off relationship when we said we gave our hearts to the Lord. And we, they just thought that was a bunch of spiritual mumbo-jumbo talk. What are we doing wasting our time with the church when we ought to be spending it building our relationships with family? I'm going to ask as you come around to have a seat now back in your pew this morning.
We only walked around six times because what happened on the seventh time as they marched around seven times? What happened? The walls fell down. This, this, morning, this morning, my friends, we have Jerichos all around us, don't we? There are Jerichos in our community. We can label them different things. Uh, there is the Jericho of the family that is dealing with the relational issues. Right? There, we, we have family members and friends who are struggling to keep themselves together and their marriage united. And we want to get to them and minister to them, but this wall is in front of us that we can't seem to break through. There are, there are walls of Jericho called, called, called finances. And there are people that are hurting and, and they're having problems making ends meet and they're struggling. And we want to, as a church, minister to them. But I don't know if you noticed, even though we are not necessarily in trouble with debt, Rush isn't the richest church and there's these walls in front of us. In our community, uh, there are people that are dealing with abusive spouses who beat them. There are people who are dealing with drug addictions, things like meth. There are people who are dealing with things called alcoholism. There are people who are struggling, and, and the truth is, some of us know those people, and we call them friends, and we might even call them family. And the church is to go up to those Jerichos where those walls are and we're, we're, to, we're to march around them with the expectation that if we'll just go where God leads us and we'll march, that the walls will fall down. But then we begin to look at our lives and we begin to, to, to close in and we say to ourselves, you know, I, I got my own family to worry about. I only have so much means. I don't have the training. I'm too old. I'm too young. All of our excuses... And it's not the preacher who's asking you. There's something in your crawl that you just can't get out. And you know it's the Lord who's asking you to do something. And you fight with him. And you argue with him. We come to a point of decision just like they did. That seventh day, they had to make the decision. Am I going to get up and march around this city one more time or seven more times, one more day with this guy who's not Moses? Do I really believe that the Lord is on it? Do I really believe we're going where we ought to go? My friends, we face the same decision this morning. We ask ourselves the question, we all do, do we measure up? You know, pastors ask the question, do I measure up to the guy who came before me? Pastors ask, do I measure up to the guy who pastors down the road? Pastors... Uh, Parishioners ask the same thing. Was I like uh, the former Sunday school superintendent? Or am I an am I president? Am I like former board members? I remember back in the days in Rush where this took place or that took place or that person was in charge. And those people are gone and we're left to carry on the legacy. And we ask ourselves, do we measure up? You know what? I'm going to tell you this morning, you may not measure up. You may not have the same abilities, the same talents, the same deep pockets. But the question is never whether we measure up to our brother or sister. The question is whether we measure up to the expectation God has placed upon our life. He asks us to, in faith to march out against what seems like an impenetrable fortress called Jericho and to march around it and believe that with a shout that the walls will fall down and that we'll be able to enter into the city and to take the city. We don't have training on, on drug addiction. I've not had a, an ounce of training in any of that. We don't have training on counseling. We don't have training on, on how, you, how you take a person from one place to another place. But we have thing, something called the Holy Spirit where we believe if God, if we're faithful to God and we follow Him and go where He wants us to go, if He's asked us to go there, that He takes care of the other end. And I can't tell you how to take down the wall of Jericho, but I can tell you that if you follow the man who knows how, and his name is Jesus, that those walls will come down. And that's where we got to measure up. This morning, I'm going to ask if the worship team would come back. And uh, they're going to, I don't even know what they're going to lead us up in worship, but I'm going to ask if you would stand. 
I'm not going to ask you to march around the sanctuary this morning. I'm just going to ask you the simple question, what does the Lord ask you about, and what is your response? If the Lord has asked something of you this morning, the last place you need to walk is to this altar this morning. If you want to see the walls begin to crumble and the walls begin to fall, as they play, it's the same as the trumpets being played. As they play, here's where the walls begin to crumble. There, there's the walls. They represent everything that we hate. How they break up our families. How they hurt those that we love. How they cause us strife. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it in my own family. I'm tired of it in my friends' families. I'm tired of it. And I just want to follow somebody who knows something about tearing down walls. And the only person I know that can do that, my friends, this morning is Jesus. come this, this morning in this portion of the service, you know, uh, there's a lot going on in our community that I'm aware of, but I know that there are things that are taking place behind closed doors that I don't know what are, I don't know what's going on. The truth is, only the Lord knows. And you've got your struggles and you've got your burdens. It's not necessarily that you, you don't believe in the Lord, but it's that there are things that are going on and you say, Pastor, if only you knew. Well, I don't. 
my friends, we serve a Jesus who does know. He's aware of what's going on. He knows what's going on. And you look at that insurmountable wall and you say to yourself, I know it's got to come down, but I can't do it. If I did it by brick by brick, I would not have enough time or energy to ever even make a dent in it. You tell me your knees are calloused from praying for those who are lost. You've lost sleep over, overnight as you've dealt with the, the trials and, and the struggles and, and you don't have any answers. My friends, I'm not telling you to come to the pastor and he's going to be able to give you the solution. I'm telling you there's only one person we can rely upon who is faithful and true and his name is Jesus. As a pastor, I want a church that is united and belief that if we follow the Lord, the walls around us, the walls of Jericho that, that have, have the enemy has encamped itself in our place will come down. God wants to do something. He needs people who are willing to move and do it. Let's pray this morning. If you've not come and you want to come as we pray, the altar is open and, and it's for you if the Lord is speaking to you this morning. Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you that you provide for us opportunities like this uh, where crazy pastors get weird ideas about marching around in a sanctuary, Lord. But Lord, you speak to us through it and, and you talk to us about what we're struggling with. You, you know the, the burdens we carry. You know the walls and the obstacles that are in front, in front of us. And at times we seem like we're going to be overwhelmed. That, that, that there's no way that we'll ever be able to overcome what we see. But the reality is we've started relying on ourselves, Lord, rather than trusting you. And as we begin to put our trust in you, those walls don't seem so impenetrable anymore. As we begin to trust in you, we begin to see cracks in the foundation. And we begin to see things crumble. And we begin to see a way in to the places that we've been shut out of. And Lord, in, in the name of Jesus, we want to ask that the walls will fall this morning. In the name of Jesus this morning, we want to ask that we will have access to where the enemy has shut us out. In the name of Jesus, we want to ask those who are, who are unsaved, Lord, that we're going to see their salvation. In the name of Jesus, we want to ask that those places where we've struggled with our finances, or we've struggled with our, with our spouse, we've struggled with our child, and we've had broken relationships, that, Lord, you're going to bring restoration. We believe, Lord, that not because of something we do, but because we're willing to rely upon you and your immeasurable amount of resources, that we will be capable of doing it. Lord, let the walls of Jericho and the surrounding, uh, surrounding our communities begin to crumble so people can come and meet you and find their restoration and find rescue and find refuge. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. We love you, Lord. In your most precious and holy name, and all God's people said, amen.
Yeah. 